I've been a fan of Michael's writing for about uh, 10 years now. I came late. I must have picked up um, uh, Live or Die. Life, Life or, or Death. Death. God, oh, how did I get that wrong? Um, You're uh, thinking em- movies. In about, <laughs> about in 2015. It was published in 2015, yeah. wasn't it? Hmm. And I, it's set in America and I thought, oh, I've discovered another American crime writer. And... Then I thought, oh, I like that so much, I'm going to get another book. And then all of a sudden it's being set in the UK, in London. And uh, that was the introduction to Joe O'Loughlin. Mm. And Ruiz, D.I. Ruiz. <laughs> and uh, Vincent. Yes. Yeah. Um, but what, what interests me is, I, OK, you're Australian, you lived in the UK... You wrote this book that's set in the United States. How do you get the idiom, that rhythm of language that is so American? Um, yeah, no, so just off stage I told Margaret that my, my favourite ever review of mine was uh, a review for life or death and it was in the Dallas News and they referred to me as a true son of Texas. <laughs> and I don't know whether that's a compliment or not really. <laughs> but so I'll tell you... Um, but I'll tell you a quick. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's, it's, I'll tell you a quick story. Initially, when I when I was I came up with the idea of, of life or death from a, a small story in the City Morning Herald in 1985, a two paragraph story about a man who escaped from Long Bay Jail the day before he was due to be released. Uh, and his name was Peter Lonergan, and he'd served two murder sentences. He'd been in jail for 33 years, and he escaped the day before he was due to be released. And I carried this clipping around for about 20 years and I kept I knew there was a great story in there a great novel in there but I didn't think I was a good enough writer to tell it and I couldn't and I didn't know why anyone would escape from jail the day before it should be released I had to I had to think of a reason and then when I and then when I decided and I came up with a reason I thought America would be a great place to set it because there was a great history in America of not this is a prison based book but it opens with a prison break but things like Shawshank Redemption and the Green Mile and Brubaker, and I thought America is the setting for it. But I'll quickly tell you, initially I thought I was going to set it in Arkansas, not Texas, and I spent the longest week of my life in this tiny town called Jasper in the, in the Ozark Mountains, and I knew I was in trouble the moment I arrived in Jasper because everyone knows the Americans are the normally the friendliest people in the world, and when you meet them travelling, they're the first to introduce themselves and ask you where you're from. But I knew I was in trouble when I drove into this town and the entire population was sitting in lawn chairs just staring at the road, (laughs) waiting for someone to arrive. (laughs) And I swear to God, the only only thing missing in Jasper was a blind kid playing the banjo. (laughs) And, and And I booked at the Ozark River Hotel and the only place to eat in town was the Ozark River Cafe. And Amber, my waitress, had a gun on her hip as she took her <laughs> orders. And she was the only person that would speak to me for about three or four days. I'm in this town and it was the least friendly, most intimidating place I'd ever been to. And then I finally <coughs> saw on the Ozark River Cafe wall there was a flyer advertising a, a concealed handgun carry course <laughs> run by the Arkansas Sheriff's Wives Association. <laughs> And I thought, that's how I meet people. I sign up for a gun course. (laughs) And I got on this, I signed up and I got on a bus and we're driving off to this gun range and there are two grandmother in front of me and one of them says to the other, Hank, don't want me to get no automatic pistol. Why ever not? He says, I'll get riled and I'll shoot him. (laughs) Would you? Only in the leg. Anyway, we go to the gun range and, and it's clear half the money is going to the NRA, the National Rifle Association. So it's a, and um, you know, this is in the height of the election, the second election campaign for uh, Obama. You know, um, and this was not <laughs> an Obama stronghold. And, um, and we've, I had to fire off all these shots and then they gave us 20 true or false questions on a sheet. And someone put their hand up and complained that it wasn't multiple choice. (laughs) 
but I have my concealed handgun carry pass. <laughs> and when I got back to my hotel, I mean, I, 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 I had managed to talk to a few people and whatnot. I'd realised actually by then that, that Arkansas, it wasn't the book I wanted to write, couldn't be set in a small town because everyone would know any stranger coming in. I had to set it in a big city like Houston. And so I knew, but I was sort of trapped there because I still had another two days before I, and, um, but I'm in my hotel room and there's a knock on the door and it's the sheriff. And there's a guy called Sheriff Slape and he's a big old boy and he fills the door frame. And he said, uh, I hear you've been taking photographs of our bank. <laughs> and I had. I'd been going through town, taking photographs of lots of buildings. And I, and, and I explained, oh, first, my first thing is, is, is there a law against that? And he said, oh, no, 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 sir. He said, there's a law against being an asshole. <laughs> okay. And so I then explained that I was a writer and... I was researching this book and I was about a guy who escapes from prison the day before he's due to be released. And Sheriff Slape said, well, that'd make him dumber than shit on a biscuit. <laughs> Which is a line that appears in the book. <laughs> um, and then he said, uh, does he get shot? And I said, would you like him to get shot? He said, I said, that'd be good. And he said, is there a sheriff in your story? I said, yeah, is, is he the hero? And I said, oh, absolutely. <laughs> liar. <laughs> liar, liar. I know, and I've never been back. I've never been back. So to get that language, do you just listen to people? Yeah, I did a lot of listening. I, I listened to a lot of... Um, I read a lot of books set in that and listened to a lot of audio books set in Texas and read by... And it's a really interesting thing that... Um, Little things you, you don't... I mean, to be called a true son of Texas... Like, you know, when you're in it, California, they talk about the I-45 or the... They put a the in front of, of, of the interstate. In Texas, it's just, I went I-45, not I went the I-45. And little things like that, if you get it wrong, then people immediately know you're not from this... You're yeah. not from this part of the world. So I had to have a lot of people read it um, afterwards and um, it's a bit like even when I wrote The Secret She Keeps, which was told from two women's point of view, both of whom are, you know, are pregnant at the, at the beginning of the story. I had so many women read that book. So I'd never, I think only once before I had it written from totally from first person female perspective and that was two first person women women's perspective and I, I had everyone from teenagers to young women to middle-aged women to elderly women I wanted everyone to read it and if I if there was a single bum note if there was a single moment where they said this is just a man pretending to be a woman I wanted to know because you know um and, and that that book required me to eavesdrop on mothers groups and on conversations <laughs> in cafes and and reading blogs I mean I, I read so many blogs written by brilliant young women who were complaining about their shitty boyfriends or their shitty bosses or the that shitty time of the month you know or whatever and they were just and you realize I mean this might sound naive they don't go to work on Monday and talk about the footy results on the weekend you know they you know there's it's a completely new mindset you have to get yourself into. And, and uh, the same thing happened in Texas. Because you did it again with the Ninth Ferry. Um, and I'm just assuming that a fair number of you have read some of Michael's books, if not all of them. Um, you write through the eyes of a young Sikh woman. Now, Which I, I couldn't do today. Tony, if I try to write that book today, it's... Uh, uh, it, it's told through Alicia Barber, the main character, is an Anglo-Indian policewoman who's in her late 20s. But the world, I mean, I wrote that book in, in 2004. Sorry, what am I saying? Yeah, two, 2005. And if I wrote that book today, I would be accused of, uh, accused of cultural appropriation yeah. for writing her story. And, um, but when I wrote it, that sort of wasn't a, a, a hot-button issue. But um, yeah, I'd, I would. I wouldn't be able to write from her point of view Isn't today. Isn't that interesting? Because you know her family come alive so beautifully in that book. Yeah. <laughs> Although I've got to tell you a funny story about talking about criticism. I got. I got 
I've only had two really negative poisonous reviews in my in my career, thankfully. And one of them was a woman who reviewed the Night Ferry in um, one of the big Scottish newspapers. And she said, as I discovered later, it was a woman who'd been working on a book uh, about the very issue that book was about in terms of people trafficking and 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 but she said that it was so clearly it was so clearly written by a man you know this character of Alicia Barber and not only that it was written by a man who had a breast fetish <laughs> <laughs> so I I, th I was horrified so I went back through and I did a word search of, of my book and there were indeed seven references to breasts um, <laughs> at one point there were vehicles parked abreast on the vehicle deck of a ferry <laughs> Uh, someone had a breast of chicken, someone had a name tag on their breast, uh, and, um, or someone did breastfeed a baby, someone did breast, but yeah, and so I suddenly thought, well, I cannot win here, I now have a breast fetish. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's interesting because there's a social issue at the heart of that too, hmm. and I mean, are those issues important to incorporate in a lot of your work? I think one of the great, it's funny, I, I'm a reluctant crime writer in the sense that when I first wrote The Suspect and it sold on a, a part manuscript of a, only 117 pages, it triggered a, a bidding war. And I didn't know it was a crime novel. Because I, I don't plot my books, so I never know how, I didn't know how that this book of 100, it introduced Joe O'Loughlin, but I didn't know, you know, how it was going to end. And and so initially I, I was a bit... Um, I, not upset's too strong a word, but I, I suddenly thought I've been labelled here as a crime writer. But it, I very quickly came to realise that there are so many issues, societal issues, and you know, very personal issues that I can write about and I can shine a spotlight on when you write crime. And you know, issues like you know, people trafficking or drugs or mental health or coercive control. And, I, and I've written about all of those things over the, over the years. Um, and I think the, the trick is, though, to tackle the issue, but as Stephen King always says, it's still all about the story. Don't preach to people. Don't, don't sort of browbeat them and hammer them ahead over on some issue. Have it as the background ha and you can sort of make certain points and shine a light on it. But nothing, nothing should be sacrificed for the story. Ultimately, it's only a cracking story and, and characters that people care about that are going to might want to want them to finish that book and to and if if they learn something along the way or if if um, it illuminates something for them along the way then great well now to Joe O'Loughlin who is the um, lead character from well, how many nine yeah they say nine he's really a minor character in a couple of books but yeah he's in nine books um, why did you give him Parkinson's? I'm very annoyed <laughs> with you about that. That's a legacy of the fact that, you know, when, you know, I dreamed of being a writer since I was about 11 years old and I'd made a career in journalism and then as a ghostwriter and when I sat down to write a novel, I honestly, I was making a good living as a ghostwriter and I honestly thought if I did manage to get it published, it would sell 12 copies and my mother would buy eight of them. <laughs> and so this idea of having a long career and writing more than one book didn't even enter my head. And, and, but I loved when I gave Joe... I wanted to write, I guess, the antidote to the Jack Reacher, Jason Bourne, James Bond figure who could outfight, outdrive, outshoot, outscrew, out everything, any other man in the book. You know what I mean? And I wanted to create a character like Joe Lockett who had a brilliant mind but a crumbling body. Who, who's, you know, so I gave him early onset Parkinson's. And he's a bit like, you know, we looked at those... I'm sure many of you remember watching Muhammad Ali light the flame at the Atlanta Olympics. I mean, he's the greatest athlete of my generation. And you see this, what he, you know, the shambling sort of figure he'd become. There is a sort of tragic sort of tragedy to that and it's like seeing a brilliant dancer crippled or a brilliant racehorse crippled or what Stephen Hawking a brilliant mind trapped in you know trapped in that twisted body and so I wanted to create a character like that who had to outthink you know his adversaries but I never imagined that there would be any more than one book with him and even when I wrote even when I it was signed up to do more than one Joe's not the main character in the second book 
Vincent Ruiz becomes the main character in that second book. And in the third book, The Night Ferry, Joe's not in it at all. Um, and it was only because my publishers kept pressing me and readers kept pressing me, saying, we love Joe, are you going to bring him back? And I came up with an idea in Shatter, which I thought was a brilliant that only a psychologist could tell that story, that I brought him back. And I joked that the only reason I kept bringing him back is my wife refused to sleep with me unless I sorted out Joe's personal life. <laughs> you know. And I had to keep bringing him back because at each book when I thought I was going to make him happy, I, I didn't. And she said, no, 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 you've got to make him happy before you can leave him. Yeah, because it's in the suspect, I think, that he... Um, he it's his own personal flaw hmm. that stuffs his marriage. It is. It? it is, yeah. And I think, well, that's the one thing I wanted to create with this idea of um, Joe. I mean, this idea, people often talk about one of the great things with, with all good writing is that you, you know, in Shakespeare, you with these tragic flaws is you don't create perfect characters. And, 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 and I love this idea that Joe, who has got the most brilliant understanding of, of human behaviour and human psychology, um, is, you know, there are two things... There are two people in the world that Joe can't read. I mean, he's got, you know, and one is the woman he most loves, you know, because he can understand everyone in the room. He could look at each, and if Joe was here now, he'd look at each and every one of you and the way you're sitting and where you've chosen to sit and what you're wearing, and he would know far more about you than you ever wanted another person to know because he has that understanding of, of people. But the pe person he can't read, or the two people he can't read, one is the Julianne, the woman he most loves. He just cannot get it. And the other is himself. I mean, he's like a lot of doctors are their worst patients, you know. He, as a psychologist, just is terrible at understanding his own motivations. I love the dynamic between those two because she would always say, and what put most pressure on that marriage was that, you know, I understand that you're a very you know, humane, uh, uh, empathetic human being and you want to help people. But when fire breaks out, why aren't you the person that runs the other direction yelling fire? Why are you the person that runs into the burning building? And that was Joe. Joe would run into the burning building. Well, uh, the psychology bit, where did your knowledge of that come from? I mean, because whatever. Um, that came from, and some people have heard me tell the story before. Um, I'm sure many of you remember a brilliant TV series called Cracker. Um, that starred Robbie Coltrane as yeah. Fitz, the psychologist. Uh, Jimmy McGovern wrote that, and Paul Abbott wrote that the several and other a few series of Cracker, uh, and they based that series on the work of Paul Britton. And Paul Britton is uh, the pioneer of offender profiling in the UK. He was a clinical psychologist that had spent his life working in Broadmoor and Rampton, and um, with the criminally insane, deciding if they could ever be treated or released or, or had to be locked up forever. And um, I did two books with Paul. One was called The Jigsaw Man and the other was called Picking Up the Pieces. And I'll tell you one, and I've, I'll tell you one quick Paul Britton story which will give you an understanding of where my fascination came about. I mentioned earlier that he would know more about everyone in this room than they wanted anyone, any stranger to know. Well, psychologists don't get called into most crime scenes because most crime scenes are tragic but mundane. When two guys get into an argument in a pub and one of them decides to run the, over, the other one over in the car park, you don't need a psychologist to explain. They get called in when the crime is so off the scale of normal human behaviour that the police want someone to explain to them why one human being would do that to another human being. So, Paul got summoned one day to 74 Cromwell Street in Gloucester, a house belonging to Fred and Rosemary West, when three bodies had been discovered in the back garden of the house. One of them was believed to be the West's eldest daughter, Heather, who had disappeared years earlier. And so Paul Britton walked through the garden and he looked at these three bodies and there was evidence that they had died painfully and slowly and then he walked through the house, then he went back to the police station and he watched Fred and Rosemary West being interviewed and they were denying all knowledge of how these bodies got into their garden. And then Paul Britton sat down with a senior detective and said, OK, you're dealing with serial sexual psychopaths. This is how they meet, this is how they combine. And he went, he went bang, 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 he listed, he profiled them. And the very last point he made was they bury their bodies close because they like to fantasise about what they've done. And so the senior detective said, OK, so that's why they've used the garden 
And Paul Britton said no. They've used the garden because the house is full. <laughs> they dug up the basement of the house and found five bodies. Oh, shit. So I was never interested. And I have never written a book that involves the torture of, uh, you know, of like serial killer torture, Hannibal Lecter type stuff. But I was fascinated with how Paul Britton knew that, how he had that understanding. And so when I created the character of Joe O'Loughlin, and um, I wanted someone, and Paul Britton is nothing like Joe as a, as a, as a person, but um, I wanted someone that had that understanding. And, and similarly with Cyrus Haven, you know, in, in the later series as well. But um, my knowledge comes, re I did two books with Paul, and many of the actual stories that formed these, no that were the seeds of these novels, um, came from cases that Paul worked on that we couldn't put in the book or, you know, um, yeah, and, and I suddenly thought, oh, I could, I could fictionalise that and that would be really interesting. So you, uh, you nabbed stuff from... Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, probably the most famous one, I, well, I'm going to say this, and I know there's no copies of this book up there, so you're all going to get angry. Um, although, but, you know, there's a bookseller. You can just order it. No, uh, it's uh, probably the purest book, psychological thriller, I've ever written is a book called Shatter. Okay. Um, it's a Joe O'Loughlin book, but it's, it's dark. But it's not big body counts or anything like that, but it is just chilling. And this book began its idea as Paul Britton was asked to help catch a guy in Newcastle in England um, who... and. W w the story I'm going to tell you now mirrors the exact story that happened in Sydney several years later, well before I wrote the book. And it's funny, when I started work on the book, I, I, was, I met a 60 Minutes producer that happened to live locally and we just were chatting and he said, what are you working on? And I mentioned this story and he said, oh, that's happened in, that's happened in Sydney. And that's the first I knew of it. And so I actually combined the two stories. But this particular guy in Newcastle and in Sydney, they would go through the local newspaper and they'd wait until there was a story there about some local lass from the local high school that had been uh, had won the Stedford or had been selected in the state netball team. or And there would be often a picture of the girl and she'd be in a school uniform or there'd be mention of what school she went to and what suburb she lived in. I mean, we've all read that story so often before. But enough information that this particular gentleman could then wait until that girl was safely at school on Monday and would ring until he got, hit ring random numbers through the phone book until he got the mother at home and said, okay, is that, is that Sally's mum? Yes, I said, uh, well, Sally's had an accident at school. Uh, I thought something might be broken and she, needed, she might need an x-ray but I think she's going to be okay. Well, well who are you? I, I'm the Good Samaritan that sort of found her. She was crying, but I found her, and I'm looking after her. But, but where is she? Can I, can I talk to her? Well, she's wearing a gag at the moment and lying on the bed, but I'm going to put the phone down next to her ear, and I want you to tell her to relax and let me do what I want. Now, those children were never, ever in danger. They were all safely at school. But he knew their eye colour, their hair colour, what their school uniform looked like, what school they went to. The sort of information that those mothers are not going to hang up and ring the school. You are going to stay on that phone and you are going to plead and you are going to beg. And the guy in Newcastle in England, he would make the mothers leave the house and strip off naked and they would be found standing naked in a field, convinced that if that's the only way they had okay, to save their daughter... The guy in Australia who did it to over 200 women, he would use sound effects and they thought they were listening to their child being raped and murdered. Mm. And the most he could be charged with was making harassing phone calls under the Telecommunications Act. He mentally destroyed these women. And so um, I decided, so I wrote Shatter about a guy who did this for a reason, not just some random sicko. There's a reason he targeted, he targeted people. But I did seek the advice of Paul Britton. I said, listen, first of all, if I wrote this story, write this up, am I just going to encourage every sicko out there <laughs> to think this is, this is a crime that's so easy to commit? And Paul Britton thankfully told me that psychopaths don't read crime novels to get their <laughs> inspiration. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is the sort of book that I know my wife would only read it during daylight. 
And she said afterwards, we had never be invited to dinner again because no one would have a sick bastard like me in their house. <laughs> and people would come along to see me after reading that book. And they would, I swear to God, they were coming along to see if I had two heads or not. Because what sort of sick mind comes up with that idea? Which is why I like telling people the true story behind it. But people still come up and say, oh, that's my favourite book of yours. And I go, you are a sick puppy. <laughs> is there a line you won't cross? Yeah, there is. Although it's funny, I love telling this story. Many years ago, I was doing an interview with the late, great Peter Temple. And it was Radio National. And, and we were asked if there was a line we won't cross. And Peter said, we could boil a baby and eat it with truffles and that would be fine. But heaven help you if you harm a family pet. <laughs> so I decided to test this theory in a book called Bleed For Me. <clears throat> um, and it has led to so many death threats. I get so many threatening emails when people read this book because they're just outraged by what happens to gun smoke the dog. Uh, and my own mother rang me when she received a proof copy and demanded that I change the book. She just demanded it. She said, and she said, I spent the entire book thinking the cat was going to be next. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that was one of those. And it's funny, I always, I always reply when people send the email and they go, I was enjoying your book up until then. And I'll point out all the things that they had enjoyed <laughs> before they got to the dog, you know. Um, and it's just, we have, we have that sort of attitude. But no, there is a lot. I don't, as I mentioned, with the torture, um, you know, and, and I know in one of my books, I was accused by readers of actually putting a, 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 a tremendously graphically violent scene in there. And I had to tell them to go back and read the book. And it wasn't me, it was their imagination. I put everything off screen, off, you know. And all I'd done is had people react. They'd react to something they'd found. But the reader, I mean, I think the greatest, and Hitchcock knew this, you know, the greatest, greatest tool we have for creating fear is our own minds. And so you don't have to make something graphically violent. You know, uh, you just let the reader's imagination do that for you. There is, um, you know, in an element of sadism in your writing. <laughs> <laughs> I always remember, it's funny, it's that interesting. Do you remember the film, I'm sure you do, Reuben Reuben? Yeah. Yeah, with Tom Conti. Yeah. There's, a line in, there's a line in Reuben Reuben. Uh, the Tom Conti character plays a, a, a poet and he's, he, he does readings and, and, and events with lots of, you know, women in their book groups and the like and he you know he's forever sleeping with these women who think he's just this incredibly you know handsome charismatic poet and someone asks him at some point um what do you read and he says i read everything and he said what do you read trashy writers and he said madam there are no such things as trashy writers they're only trashy readers <laughs> 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 so it's one of those things that when um it's a bit like sort of saying you know, is there anything a sadistic writer or are there only sadistic readers? I, th I, think, I think the idea of... It's, I, I often wonder this. I remember being in South Africa on tour and there had been 50 police officers murdered in Johannesburg since during that year. Not just not talking people, just police officers. And so this was a country saturated in violence and yet all these people turned up and they love crime fiction. And I'm thinking, what on earth are you doing here? And, and the answer was obvious in the end, is most of those murders in South Africa were unsolved and went unsolved, whereas in crime fiction there's that sense of, of um, closure because invariably the bad guy you know, is caught and order is restored to the world. But I don't, I don't um, apologise for the fact that... Um, my books can be psychologically dark and they do invariably involve, and this was, I didn't realise this until it was pointed out, um, women and teenage girls in jeopardy. Yeah. And I think um, the reason for that is I have three daughters, I've been married for 35 years, and all of my nightmares, all of my nightmares involve them. And, it's, and I'm sure all parents have had that, you know, We've all, 
I mean, I will literally wake up levitating and I think I'm screaming. My wife says I'm mewling like a kitten. But invariably, you know, it's because one of my daughters has been dragged out in a rip and I can't reach her or fallen off a cliff and I can't reach her. It's that, that breathless moment and you can't. And, and, um, and also what I draw upon is anyone that's had children, I'm sure at some point lost track of them, lost sight of them in a busy place. And I don't care whether it was for 30 seconds or an hour, it is the most terrifying time in your life. And um, I remember my seven-year-old, and this is just after Madeleine McCann went missing in Portugal. Um, and we were in Portugal, and my seven-year-old thought it would be fun to hide from us in a supermarket. You know, and um, we closed down the supermarket, and I was screaming, you know, and just... And, and, um, and yeah, that sense of absolute fear or that sense of when someone you love has promised to be home by 10 and it's gone 11 and it's a you know, rainy night and, and you're just all the gremlins creep into your head saying, I hope nothing's gone wrong. And, and I think that's all I tap into. And you've got to ask the question, if people like reading that, I think we all like being scared or saying that I hate being scared. Um, my, I'm my mother's son. My, mo my, my mother once screamed so loudly in a cinema they stopped the film and turned the lights up. <laughs> and, 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 and that is me. And I scare myself when I write. Um, uh, but, um, but I think it's, you know, I think we like being scared. And I think Joe O'Loughlin, I think one of the reasons Joe O'Loughlin worked as a character was because... You trusted him so much that even if I took you in, he took you into a really dark place, you trusted him to bring you out again, yeah. that you weren't going to finish up being traumatised. He wasn't going to leave you in there, but he was going to be able to bring you out and you were going to feel, OK, it's OK. It's OK. Joe's with me. Yeah. And where did um, D.I. Lloyd's come from? Vincent. Oh, Vincent came from... Vincent is... <laughs> he's... He's one of those cliches, and but we know that they're cliches for a reason. I mean, I you know, began my career as a journalist and I did police rounds for a long while, which meant I spent a lot of time. I, I worked nights for a year. And the only people awake in Sydney, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, were the pimps and the prostitutes and the pushers and the police. And... Um, and they, when you went up to King's Cross to get a cup of coffee at three o'clock in the morning, they were the people you were having coffee with. And uh, most of the police I met during my journalistic career, they invariably had been married multiple times, you know, because it's a terrible, hard job on a marriage. Um, they had a very dark sense of humour because when you're doing really bleak work and having to go on death knocks and the like, you know, you develop that. Um, and so this idea of Ruiz is this hard-drinking, wise-cracking, um, three-times-married police officer. I mean, that is a cliché, but there are so many of them out there. They're clichés for a reason. And I think what I loved about Ruiz as a character, and I don't know whether readers felt the same way, but certainly my wife did, because Joe was that character that would go charging into the burning building, that she always was pleased when Roe entered the story because she thought, there's someone watching his back now. Yeah. There's someone there that's going to keep him safe. Except for the suspect. <laughs> yes, except for the suspect, yeah. And the other thing that interests me is the sense of place that you have in your novels. You know, they're set all over the place. You know, Amsterdam, London, where well, you lived in London and you obviously know it well, Scotland, um, uh, do you research? Because the de the detail... Yeah, no, I research a lot. Um, I always joke about when I when I wrote The Night Ferry and I sat it in Amsterdam in the red light district, it meant that all my research was tax deductible. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, no, I think the journalist to me means that I have to have researched it really well and... And that's why I set, normally I set things in real life places. Um, uh, it's only to the point where I've had, law, uh, I, I'm one of the few fiction writers that gets legaled and invariably the lawyers have to get hold of the book and they'll come to me and they'll say, okay, 
that farmhouse that you described, that whitewashed farmhouse on that hill, on that corner, is there a farmhouse there? I go, yeah, yeah, it's a real farmhouse. And, and does, is it exactly as you describe it? I go, yeah, 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 exactly. I said, well, you have to change it because you've just put three bodies in the front parlour of someone's house <laughs> and they might not be happy. And so I have to change... And I really struggle to change things when I know they're true. Do you know what I mean? That's the journalist in me. And um, uh, but occasionally, yeah, you just have to. You have to to protect because you can't. If you're doing it in a small town, like it's interesting, the new book uh, Storm Child is set in Scotland and it's set actually in Peterhead. But I changed the name because there are too many in. Pe people that I mentioned, like Harbour Masters and other people who are real characters in Peterhead and who won't appreciate yeah. the way, you know. And so sometimes you have to, you have to change things. But no, um, I do. And I love, I'll tell you how my, is it like one of my favourite research stories, or it's my second favourite. My favourite is my, is the concealed handgun carry story that I told you. The other one was when I was researching the night ferry, I had to obviously get on a vehicle ferry that crossed the North Sea because there was a really important scene that takes place on this ferry. And, and the only way you could get on this particular ferry, which left, it left Rotterdam at about 11 o'clock at night and it got into Harwich at about 5 or 6 in the morning. And it's just full of long-distance truck drivers, you know. Um, it's a really bleak voyage. But you have to be in a vehicle. You can't get on it as a, as a foot passenger. So I hired a car in the UK, I drove onto a ferry, I took it from Harwich to Rotterdam, I drove off, I waited three or four hours and then drove back onto a ferry and came back. Uh, and it worked perfectly and I did all my research and I got and I, but I came into Customs and Immigration at Harwich and they said, how long have you been away? <laughs> and I said, Ju just the night you know, in Rotterdam, you know, drug capital of Europe. And I try. I knew it looked suspicious, so I said, "Okay, I'm I'm a writer, and uh, I take my research very carefully, and and, and, I, and I'm writing this novel." And so I had to and said, "What's what's your novel about, sir?" I said, "Smuggling." <laughs> 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 and I thought he'd have a sense of humour, but I mean, they never have a sense of humour. And so this hire car, they took it apart. They they took every panel off the hire car, and they took the seats out. And when I drove it back to Hertz. It, everything rattled. <laughs> <laughs> everything rattled. <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing to me is how... how oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, it's the Europeans that pick up uh, adaptations of your work and Harlan Coben's, funnily enough. I mean, his work has been picked up by the Spanish... And the French, yeah. Yeah, by it, the yeah. French and by the Germans, and you've got this... Yeah. German connection. I've had seven films made in Germany. Yeah, yeah. I'd sort of. Uh, how did that come about? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's my biggest market in the world. Germany. It's actually bigger than anywhere else. Uh, and the first, um, probably they're all. It's. I think the book Shatter was the one which uh, which broke me in Germany. It, they called it Dein Bild Geschehe, which is Thy Will Be Done, in German. And. Um, and the first three books had been well reviewed, but had never not sold many copies. And then um, they took me. They decided they really wanted to tour me, and they took me on an eleven city tour in Germany at enormous expense. And they you travel with an actor who does all your readings for you, quite a famous actor, and um, and you have an interpreter and and you have a compare. And these events last about two hours, and they do readings and and that. That was um, huge, and I think that th that book sold three hundred thousand copies in Germany, which was just you know, and but it's very dark. And in Germany, it's the only place that I travel to that I get an inkling of what it's like to be a rock star, because I have fans waiting at the hotel that know I'm coming into town, and I'll do. I've had over a thousand people at events there who have queued for hours to get books signed. Um, I know, isn't it? Long may it continue. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your biggest market. Yeah. And it's funny, when, I, when, the film, when the first film was launched, I went to uh, the premiere and, the red, and walked the red carpet with all the actors and, and then sat, sat in the cinema. And, and, of course, 
there are no English subtitles. I'm the only person in the audience. I can't understand a word <laughs> of what's going on, you know. Um, but it was an amazing experience just watching a film. Like I knew the story, obviously, but listening to the laughter in the audience and because the one thing when I'd read the script, they, they translated the script into English for me and I thought they'd taken all the humour out. And my books, I do try to put humour in there yeah. to, to sort of lighten those because it gets very dark and tense and then to, to just have that release valve. And I thought, oh, they've taken all the humour out. And then when I, I listened to the audience and they laughed and I realised, no, the actors were putting it in there. The actors were doing what ac good actors should do, you know, and, um, and bringing this script to life, yeah. Well, uh, um, but now um, uh, the Brits are picking up your work. Yeah. Uh, so they've adapted The Suspect. They've adapted uh, The Suspect. Have they, have they picked up more? Yeah, the, uh, When You Were Mine. I mean, there's a second series of... Uh, the Joe Lachlan one being prepared or being written. And then there was a book I wrote, uh, a standalone, which is no, which is not going to be a standalone because there will be another book, uh, with a young British policewoman called Philomena McCarthy who came from a family of gangsters called When You Are Mine. Um, and that's been picked up for a TV series in the UK. And I'm writing another Philomena book which will come out next year. Um, and that's being made by the people who made um, Line of Duty and... Oh, uh, God, I love that series. Yeah. Yeah, they're really... And, well, actually, the same people made The Suspect as well. Um, but, yeah, it's the same, the same company, yeah. Do you enjoy your life as a writer and... <laughs> I mean, it's... <laughs> What's not you've to enjoy? You've had a fabulous run, haven't you? Yeah, no, I do. It's funny. I think I'm very blessed. I think one of the th issues with... Um, I mean, it <laughs> the average Australian writer, I think the earnings is something like $12,000. It's a really tough gig. I've been so fortunate. I'm so blessed. I mean, to be able to do this full time. You know, it's funny. Uh, I'll tell you, so I, I was at the Sydney Writers' Festival many years ago and uh, someone asked me the question, how hard it is to be a full time writer. And I said, it's so bloody tough. I have to wake up every morning without an alarm clock. And I have to decide if I'm going to have breakfast on the north end of the beach or the south end of the beach. And will I have the poached egg, so the breakfast panini. And my kids are at school and my wife's at home, so will we have morning delight or afternoon delight? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, no, I said, no, it's, I said, my life is full time. I am blessed. I mean, I'm, most writers would cut off their arm to have what I've, the opportunities I've had. So I know how lucky I am. And... Um, you know, and I'm still amazed given, you know, you walk into any bookshop or any library and you see the thousands of titles that anyone can yeah. choose from. And the idea that someone would choose a story that I've written and then devote the 11, 12, 30, 14 hours of their lives to read it, I find incredibly humbling. Well, you see, you're sort of an addiction, really, aren't you? <laughs> In a good way, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Your writing practice... What do you do? Do you write mornings? Do you write? Um, I, I write every day, and I mean every day. Um, uh, I had a journalist from the Australian feature writer called Greg Berup who came up to Avalon, because home now is Avalon. Um, and he came up to Avalon and he was, he, he, he'd asked to spend three days with me and he was going to write a 10,000 word piece on the life of a writer and he gave up after a day <laughs> and he wrote a thousand words and he said, you don't do anything. <laughs> I said, welcome to my world. I sit in a room and I make shit up. I mean, that's not a spectator sport. I mean, it's, um, <laughs> what did you expect? And even, like he went and interviewed my wife. I said, well, well okay, tell me, what did, what did he do? What did he do on a weekend? And she said, he writes. Oh, okay, what did, he, what did he do on Christmas Day? He said, well, he had Christmas lunch and then he went and wrote. And, and it's like, it's uh, the wonderful Peter Corus, he once said, you know, pe you know, someone asked him, what are you doing? He says, I'm writing. He says, it's like breathing. And to me, it's like breathing. If I don't write every day, A, well, the reason I have to write every day is if I don't write every day, I become convinced the book I'm writing is complete trash. And I still suffer from, I still suffer from that imposter syndrome that if I go more than a day without, I've got, I think, oh my God, what made me think that was a good idea? That's a terrible idea. This is going to be a disastrous book. You know, this is, they're going to discover I'm a fraud. And, and, and I, 
my agent, my longtime agent, who's been with me right from the very beginning, I've signed every book. You know, dear Mark, we've filled them again. Is, is that part of... Well, being an artist is, you know, having that sense of insecurity and doubt about yourself, I think, a lot of the time. Yeah. I think it's also when you write in... I envy, I envy those writers, um, literary writers, that can write a book that defines their life and their career. Um, whereas I think if you're a genre writer, you're only as good as your last book. And I know that someone like Peter Temple, when Peter Temple won, won the Miles Franklin for Truth, it crippled him. He couldn't write because he was just so bound up in this idea he had to write something that was that good and that, you know, that he had set this bar that he couldn't ever possibly reach. You know, and it just, and he, he used to kind of phone me up and say, I envy you because you can still write for fun. Um, you know, he said, whereas, uh, and I think um, I can still write for fun, um, but I'm still terrified that I'm one book away from being discovered as not really knowing what I'm doing. Do you ever want to write outside genre? Yeah, I did. And for a long while, and, and that was always the plan, I would love to write a Nick Hornby-esque or Chris Cleave or David Nichol sort of book, you know, like slightly comic and yeah. and with a lot of pathos and things in it. And um, but I've already talked to publishers about it. And if I did it, I would I would do it under my name. I don't want to, but I don't want people thinking they're picking up a book just a crime book because booksellers would put it in the crime section. Because, but I would I would just change the initials a bit like Ian Banks and Ian M Banks were two different series so yeah watch this space i'd love to i'd love to do something like that just to um well, you could do a robert galbraith yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah the op in reverse yes do a robert galbraith in reverse yeah but yeah maybe do something like that um but one thing I've, I've discovered with the tv adaptions that i know why um i don't think i'd ever get involved in another tv adaption i'll, I'll happily see my work adapted but i don't want to be in a writing room again um, and that was because, and this is going to sound really conceited, but as a writer, I'm God, you know, and, and, and I decide what goes in the book. And I'd be mad not to listen to my editors if they were all telling me around the world that, oh, this doesn't work. Of course I'm going to change it. But ultimately, if I'm passionate about something, it stays in the book. But in that TV room when, you know, you could write the best script imaginable, but then there are network notes, distributor notes... Uh, producer notes, I, I mean, they all have a say. And I just discovered through that whole process of the secret she keeps that I don't play well with others. Mm. <laughs> I just... And so I think I just like sitting in my room making shit up. Well, I think that's true with film too, you know, where you have a writer-director who <laughs> is absolutely in control of his material. And uh, yeah, I think it's funny. I, I'm, I'm mates with Michael Connolly, and and you know, and I've watched, I've been on set of Bosch in in and uh, in America. And as a showrunner in America, he's totally in control. I mean, they have to turn to Michael if the actor wants to change a single line. They have to get permission from Michael. I think I could do it then, but that again is just me being wanting to be God. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's got executive producer yeah. credit on that yeah, on yeah. those series, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah, if you show it, yeah, when you have that power, yeah. Look, um, it's just about time for audience participation. Uh, there are a couple of microphones in the room and you'll save my voice. Yes. <laughs> um, it's fabulous to have you both here today um, talking about your books and, Margaret, I hope your cold gets better. Uh, I have about a million questions, but I won't ask them all. <laughs> um, you talked a lot about your uh, the novels with Joe. Um, we haven't touched on Cyrus and Evie very much. Um, I did read that there's another one coming out this year. Is that yeah. correct? September? Yeah. Margaret's um, very luckily had a proof copy. Oh, my God. I will tackle you for it in the <laughs> car park, Margaret. <laughs> it's fine. Only the, the, the proof's got... Margaret, unfortunately, the proofs got printed with two missing pages, which were incredibly important pages. <laughs> and they didn't realise until after they'd sent some of the copies out. And so the proofs that are going out now do have the pages inserted. But Margaret had to endure the fact that this doesn't matter. Well, would you believe it? 
the pages that were inserted are from lying beside you. A totally different book suddenly <laughs> appears in the middle of this one. It is bizarre. I don't know how it could have happened. Um, but no, there's Storm Child is the fourth book in the Evie and Cyrus series. Um, and this is the book um, where you finally get to hear all of Evie's story, the, the background. The backstory. The backstory. You get, yeah. And it's sort of very topical too because it's um, threaded through with one of the big issues in the UK at the moment, which is the small boats and the small boat tragedies in the North Sea. And so the whole thing is sort of threaded through. Her story is linked to that. And um, yeah, and with a, some big twists towards the end. Um, but yeah, so there's an, yeah, that's coming on June the 26th. That will be out. And it can, you can, pre-order, you can pre- pre-order it now. It's available on pre-order now, but it's out on June 26th. Uh, Michael, thank you very much for your books, which I'm absolutely addicted to. Um, <clears throat> if I meet somebody who hasn't read your books, I give them shatter and say, <laughs> read this. So I must be a sick puppy. Yes. But look, I also want to withdraw uh, the, the comment I made on Twitter when you wrote something on Twitter. And I said, Michael, get off Twitter and just get on with writing your next book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and for yeah, I, I, now I, that I know how much you write. <laughs> yeah, I know it's one of those. Um, yeah, well, it's funny. It, you, it's always like when you go to an event, like when you post on your site that you're off touring your book. You get some people that are complaining about why aren't you home writing the next one, and and of course last year was the first year in seventeen years I didn't have a book out, and um, and that I mean. I love it when, when you tell publishers you're not going to have a book because they put this fixed smile on their face which like a rictus grin and nod saying that's great and, thinking, and all the time you can see it going how much is this going to cost us, you know, um, no book next year. Um, but, um, but yeah, a lot of people then got outraged. What do you mean there's not going to be a book? What do you mean? I mean, so you've had to wait two years. I'm sorry about that. But it was all trying to catch up with... Um, the reason there was no book, I was trying to let my foreign translations catch up because um, it means that come June, that all, instead of foreign translations being a year afterwards, and what's happening in Europe is most people can speak English so well, if they have to wait for, you know, even five months to get their German or French or Italian copy, they will simply read in English, and, and they can. And the only way to make it worthwhile translating the book is to make sure those translations are available as soon as the English language version is available. So that was the reason for the delay. Um, and also, because I promised my wife I, I wouldn't, I would take her overseas and not be writing a book while we were travelling. <laughs> Good what one. What do you do if you have to write every day? What do you mean? What do I do if I have to write every day? Well, if you don't write every day, you go. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's. Um, I take a book with me, and I write when I write when. I, I'm fine as long as I don't deny her anything. Any, anything she wants to do, I can say I can leave. And but, but if we're, it's funny. I mean, I, I, I this came, this from my when my youngest daughter was six years old, she came to me once, and this sums up my 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 life really. Um, being surrounded by women and also being compulsively writing, she said, "Daddy, you're not like other dads, are you?" And I said, "In what way, dear?" And she said, "Well, you don't go off to work like other dads in a coat and tie." And I said, "No." I, he said, oh, well, you don't wear tradies boots and drive a ute. And I said, no, I don't. And he said, you don't even, you don't go off to work, you know, off to the pub after work and have a beer with your mates, do you? And I said, no, no, I don't. You don't even watch State of Origin, do you, Dad? <laughs> I said, no. And she said, you're a bit of a girly man, aren't you? <laughs> she was six years old. Wow. Out of the mouths of babes, yeah. Um, no, it's it's almost the case of yeah, and and it's I can't if I'm doing something like you know, um, I, I've got, I ask myself w- would I prefer to be writing, and if I'd prefer to be writing, and even my wife, you know, she refuses to let me do anything like the gardening or when I want to do it, I want to paint that fence or because it's you know, and she says no no no, we'll get a little man in because she said you go and write. Are there any more questions? Another question? Because we haven't talked about Cyrus Haven and Evie very much. No. Where did that... Because he's a psycho- psychologist as well. I mean... Yeah, well, I, I, I think with Cyrus I wanted to keep the theme, but I wanted someone 
younger, but I gave Cyrus, if those who haven't read, Cyrus has got a tragic backstory that he's the sole survivor of a, a family massacre. He came home at the age of 13 and discovered his twin sisters and his parents uh, had been killed. And they've been killed by a schizophrenic, uh, paranoid schizophrenic older brother who is becomes a recurring character through the books. Um, and then the character of Evie, who can tell when someone's lying, and she came from um, several things, actually. One was, a many people will probably remember the Brian Oliver Sacks book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And, and he, he tells a story in that book about aphasia patients who were watching Ronald Reagan being interviewed during the Iran-Contra hearings in America. And Ronald Reagan was saying, I do not recall, I do not recall, I do not recall. And they were laughing at the screen. And, and Oliver Sacks said, why are you laughing? And I said, well, he's lying. And they would have no concept, you know, be given their mental you know, illness of who Ronald Reagan was or what he was talking about, but they could tell he was lying because of this micro-expressions. And then a guy called Paul Ekman, Professor Paul Ekman, came up with the term, he was the world's expert on, on lying. And there was a show called Lie to Me quite a number of years ago based on the work of Paul Ekman. And so um, that would sort of fascinate me about creating a character who can tell tell when someone is lying. There's a question up there. Uh, thanks, Michael and Margaret. Um, I read somewhere uh, a while back that Lee Child um, basically starts writing. He doesn't really plot, plot his stories and he just sees where the writing takes him and he writes what he would like to see, maybe. Um, others will anally plot hmm. their story totally. Which way do you... Travel on that. Uh, I'm definitely the first way. I mean, someone like Jeffrey Deaver will write, or someone like Jane Harper, the same, will write incredibly detailed outline of the book. And um, I couldn't write like that. It would sort of, I'd know on Tuesday at three o'clock what I was going to be writing, which is, I, I would hate that. Um, I like it. I, uh, the best analogy I've ever heard is um, Stephen King. He talks about you discover a bone sticking out of the ground and you begin brushing the dirt away like an archaeologist, you know, and, and you hope that what you're going to uncover is a dinosaur. And, you know, you'll hope for that. You know, it could finish up being a dog bone, which means you're going to just throw it away. And, um, but you're really hoping that what you're uncovering is a dinosaur. And so that's the way I write, just brushing the dirt away. And, um, and it's exciting. I mean, when I, you know, when I come in, to, you know, from my cabana of cruelty, which is what my children call my office... Um, <laughs> And I say, and I say to my wife, "You would not believe what just happened." <laughs> I figure if I haven't seen it coming, then you, the reader, won't see it coming. Uh, and so, um, it's it's like riding, it's like being on a high wire without a net. You know, being at, you know at times because you're, you know, you do fall and you have to throw away a large number of words because you've written yourself into a terrible, terrible, off a cliff, let's say. Um, but when it works, yeah, it's just so, it's exciting. It's organic and ex exciting. And and um, the only problem is, it's funny, I'm great mates with Val McDermott. And, and Val, she says that when she leaves her writing room, the characters, she can lock the door and the characters stay in that room all night. And then she just goes back in the next day. Whereas my characters just follow me around and whisper in my ear and talk to me and, 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 and I can't sleep because they're just... And particularly when I reach that point in the book where they are in great danger and they are, they are you know, in a sense hanging off you know, by their fingertips, I'm there with them and I'm thinking I have no idea, no idea how to save them. And it was never more so than in The Suspect, that first book, I reached, and that sold on a part manuscript to 23 languages. And I got towards the end of that book. And Joe O'Loughlin, his um, marriage was in tatters, his career was in tatters, he was wanted for murder. And I had no idea how I was going to save him, how this brilliant man with this brilliant mind was going to manage to get out of this because someone had completely screwed with his life. And this went on. The reason I have no hair is because of this went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And finally, I had this eureka moment where I realised how I was going to save him. And I wrote manically for 36 hours 
to get that story down because I was fearful that if I didn't get it down and I got hit by a bus tomorrow, Joe would go to prison for the rest of his life for murder. <laughs> and you know that's how it really was to me, that I had to save him. If something happened to me, I was the only person in the world that knew how to save him and I had to save him. And, and the only other thing I can liken that to is when I wrote The Night Ferry, um, you know, Vivian, my wife, had to, had to come to terms with the fact that for 12 months I was seeing another woman, <laughs> uh, Alicia, and we would be out to dinner and Vivian would see my eyes glaze over and I'd get a kick under the table and she'd go, you're with her, aren't you? <laughs> wow. Yeah, and... Um, yeah, and it's it's um, it's all consuming, and and she does always say that I love it when you finish a book because I feel as though I get you back. Yeah. Um, yeah, is there another question? There's one at the back. One more from our bookseller. Hello, Michael. Um, my question's around how long do you spend in an area researching a book? So I'm thinking more around. You obviously spent a lot of time in Nottingham and around the area, you know, with Rampton and things like that. And I'm obviously from that sort of neck <laughs> of the woods. So when I read it, I remember thinking, wow, you, you must live here. So um, how long do you, do you spend research and how long do you actually live around? Probably, the probably not as long as you think. Although I've got to tell you a funny story. Before I chose not, I was trying to think of somewhere that I could, I could set the Evie and Cyrus books that was outside of London. Because one of the things with, I mean, cities change very dramatically. London is a very different place now to what it was when I lived there, you know. Um, whereas small towns or smaller places, you know, they change um, more slowly. Uh, but initially, I thought, I want to set the new series in, um, uh, in a place that everyone knows the name. And so I thought, Coventry. I said, because, you know, everyone's knows the Lady Godiva story and they, they, you know, being sent to Coventry, they've heard that line. Being, and so I then, I arranged and I went to Coventry and discovered it's a complete shithole. <laughs> and it's not Coventry's fault, but it was bombed into oblivion by the Luftwaffe and it's just this really soulless 70s concrete and it's really ugly and lovely people and all that, but just not a very... And straight away I thought, well, that's no good. Um, I can't and then I thought, what's I thought, Nottingham? Everyone knows Nottingham. They know the Robin Hood leg legend and whatnot. So I thought, and I had spent time in Nottingham because the very first ghost-written book I did was the um, was the Margaret Humphrey story, uh, which got made into the film Orange and Sunshine. That book was the basis of Orange and Sunshine, the film, and uh, she was the woman who uncovered the child migrant scandal. And she lived in Nottingham. She was a Nottingham social worker. And so I spent a lot of time in Nottingham when I was working uh, with Margaret on that very first ghost-written book. And then I just went back up and, and when I was... Because obviously Nottingham's in the new book, uh, Storm Child. And I think I spent ten days in Nottingham then. The first trip I think I spent two weeks in Nottingham. But the one advantage you have now is um, Google Earth means you can zoom in down into any street and, you know... And, but you've got to be so careful because at times... You know, I have very diligent editors and I set the books in real life places and you suddenly, you know, I remember in The Secret She Keeps setting it in Barnes, you know, in, in South London there. And, you know, and the yoga studio that I featured burned down before the book was published and in the last minute I have to suddenly alter it because that yoga studio no longer existed, you know. Um, you know, and that's the sort of thing that you can't, you can't, you know, you try to... Well, that the worst case of that was in Good Girl, Bad Girl, the very first of the Cyrus books. It actually opens with the two words of March 2020 and there's no mention of COVID. Because I wrote that book a year before COVID even existed and I set it in March 2020. And, um, and all I could do really is in the acknowledgements when it was published saying there's no mention because of just that reason. You know, um, you know, and uh, you can only do your best, really. But yeah, I do spend as much time as I can. Oh, that was amazing! Thank you very, very much for a wonderful, wonderful journey. Thank you. We have had we have had a real treat today from Margaret and Michael. Really, thank you.